Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. I want to talk a little bit about the open roof. The open roof. You've always heard uh, the, the saying, where there's a wheel, there's a way. You've heard that, right? Uh, you know, the Bible teaches us without a vision, the people perish. Can you imagine how this gentleman's life would have ended up if his friends did not have a vision for him to see Jesus? We as friends and we as family members and we as co-workers and we as neighbors, we need to have a vision so that people may see Jesus. There'll be obstacles that we have to, to, that we have to encounter. There'll be things that, uh, that will, will allow us to get out of our comfort zone. But if we just trust in the Lord, He always has a way. Aren't you grateful for that today? If you found your place, uh, just stand with us today if you're physically able uh, for the reading of God's Word. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 5. 1 through 5. And God's Word reads, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together in so, in, in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the Word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when, when they would, could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and they and and they and when they were and when and when they had broke broken it up, they lay, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the, the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Father, we ask today, Lord, for your blessing, Lord, to be upon this reading, and Lord, upon your messenger. Give us strength. May, our, may you touch our throat, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now we see in this account, and we see in this, in, 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 in this situation that Jesus was preaching in Capernaum. He, he's, we see here that he was in the house, and the house was in so much uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that there was no room anywhere around, and they gathered so much, and, and so much that there was noise within the house. You know, we need, to have, we need to have noise within our house about Jesus. I'm not talking about noise that comes from entertainment. I'm not talking about noise that comes from video games. And I'm not talking about noise that comes from life in general. But we need to have noise in our house, in our churches, and in our lives that surround and that is around Jesus. As they started preaching. And they started, uh, they, uh, he started preaching and there was great noise abroad and the fame spread throughout. I believe today when we give the world something that they're looking for, there'll be people start spreading the word. There'll be people start spreading the word. As he was preaching in Capernaum, he was allowing a message to be presented. As we think here today, there was, uh, as, as one was brought, abound uh, with the palsy. And verses, uh, verses 2 and 3, and it says straightway, they gathered themselves in so much that there was no room to receive him. And, and, and not, uh, no, not much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, palsy which was born afore. The man today was a bit fast man. He had no hope. We see that in verses, uh, we see that in verses 3. Uh, we see here today that he could not reach Jesus no matter what he did. We see that also in verse 3. No matter what we do, we are helpless on our own. No matter who we are, no matter what we're able to do, it is still not good enough. We need Jesus. We see that the people, the house was filled with people. But these men would not stop. They had a vision for their friend. 
They had a vision. It, didn't, it doesn't name who they were. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily present who they are. But we know that they were people that had a desire to see their friend or this individual touched and, and, and to be able to be healed again or, and, 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 and be whole once again. We see that. We have family and friends today that physically they're a picture of health. But inside they're bound. Inside there's no hope. Inside they have tried everything to come to the realization that they need something, but they just don't know how to get there. I believe that's our responsibility. We can't save anyone, but we can shine the light to lead them to Jesus. We can't, uh, we, we can't change anyone, but we can lead them and we can show them the man that can change everything for their lives. These men knew physically of the only thing that they could do was bring him to Jesus. And Jesus would take care of the problem. They had faith. We see so many people in our communities and so many people in our families that have lived in sin and they have wrecked their life not just spiritually but physically and they're just wore out and we have seen them time and time again and in our mind we're saying, can the Lord really save them? Shame on us. Shame on us. If the Lord can save us, why can't He save anyone? If the Lord can save a child that is just as innocent as, as innocent can be, why can't He save the drunk that's fallen in the gutter and has no hope for their life? We're putting a limit on God's grace and God's mercy. And God's grace is boundless and His mercy is limitless. So we see that they brought the man. But we also see that they had challenges, challenges as they brought him to Jesus. Let's look in verse 4. Let's look in verse 4 of our text chapter. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they, had bre- and when they broke it up, they, laid down the, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Boy, they got, they got creative, didn't they? They got creative. Listen, I believe that we need to get creative when we're telling people about Jesus. You know, I, I believe that all, I believe that the, the God's word is what strikes terror and conviction in people's heart. I believe that, and I don't think that we need to do away with that. I believe that we need to stand up on that, and if anything, we need to hold it that much closer. But I also believe that the Bible teaches us to compel people to come in to the church. Hey, if a hot dog's going to get somebody into church, let's give them a hot dog. That's not going to save them. But it's going to come in and so they can listen about Jesus. Hey, if a clothes giveaway is going to get people to come to church, well, let's give all the clothes away we can. I hear some preachers say, well, I, I agree. Hot dog won't save us and clothes ministry won't get us anywhere. But it's compelling people to see who Jesus is and letting them know that there is a Savior that loves them. We need that. So here they are, they're being creative. They're they're thinking, as we say, they're thinking outside the box. And as they had the challenges, they they, they had the multitudes that was crammed in this little home. We see that the house were filled with people. We've seen that in verse 2. We've seen that these men would not be stopped by anything. We see that in verse 4. Aren't you grateful today that this is a picture of a New Testament church bringing people to Jesus? You know, that's what we're, that's what we all, that's what we're all about. Without Jesus, we, we, ex- we stop existing being a church. Without Jesus, we're no longer, we're just a, a civic organization that gathers here, and that's all we are. But we need to be about Jesus. We need to be for Jesus. We need to be with Jesus. And we need to allow Jesus to move upon us in a mighty way. We as a New Testament church, and we as a church that's Bible-believing, that's soul-searching, and looking for the lost. We must meet the challenge 
head on, ask the Lord for discernment, and go about presenting the gospel to a lost world. I've had a lot of hard jobs. I, you know, when, 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 you're, uh, when Drew was driving up through Unicoi, boy, I thought I can remember going to Unicoi sometimes six days a week. If I went in one day, I didn't know what day I was going into another shift. Oh, it was, if they just left me on one shift for a whole week, I'd have been fine. But sometimes I worked all three shifts in one week. And my title was a heavy carcass builder. Sounds kind of fancy, doesn't it? No, not really. But I can remember building those tires and, and building the carcass of that tire is what it was called. And I can remember those, those, those days that, boy, that we were just wore out. Me and another gentleman, we were, two, we were the two smallest people there, Roger, and we could build a, a tire more than what. And when you're only building three tires a day and you build an extra one, that's pretty good. I'm not sure if I'd do that today. Us being the smallest ones, we had something to prove, I guess. I've worked other jobs where they've been long hours. I've had difficulties. But soul winning has to have the most challenges. But with that being said, it's got the most rewards. There's more than just a paycheck. There's things that's out of this world. We may never see, we may never see in this world the things that we presented to the gospel to someone and then maybe they move out of town or maybe we never see them again. They go to a local Bible-believing church because of what we allowed them to start thinking of and they receive Jesus Christ and now they're working for the Lord. Soul winning is challenging, but it's rewarding. And we as a church must focus upon soul winning. We as a church must allow ourselves to be Christ-centered and Christ-oriented for the, for the furtherance of His gospel. We see here today that the open roof led them to salvation. The open roof led them to salvation. Aren't you grateful today that Jesus says, I am the door? Any man that goes, He says, the only way that you're going to get that, that wonderful place called heaven is if you come through this door. We see here today in chapter 4, or excuse me, in verse 4, we see here that it was, it was his doorway to Jesus. It was his doorway. They couldn't go through the door. Didn't say if there's a window in there. But, but if they could, if there would have been somebody sitting in the window or standing around the window. The only thing they had to do was come from up and lower him down. Aren't you grateful today that somebody presented us to the door? We went in. And we realized that if we accept Him, then we're no longer bound to the things of this world. Think about it just for a moment in verse 4 as we go back there again. And they could not come nigh unto Him because of the press, so they uncovered the roof. Can you imagine if the homeowner's looking up there and thinking, I just fixed that roof yesterday. There's always, somebody, there's always somebody that has something to complain about, even if something's good's happening. But it was his doorway to Jesus. It was his doorway to deliverance. Think about that for a moment. Wasn't Jesus our door to deliverance? Didn't sin have us bound in captivity? Didn't sin have us uh, just... just in bondage and there was no hope for us it just felt like uh, there was just cumbersome upon us and, and no matter where we turned there was no hope or joy or peace or satisfaction until somebody showed us the door who is that door Jesus Jesus we see here in verses 12 of that same chapter in verse 12 and it says immediately he arose and took up his bed and went forth before them all, and so much that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. Maybe people said the same thing about you when you received Jesus Christ. You found the door, Jesus Christ. You went in, and maybe people said, oh, he won't last. Oh, he won't be 
it won't be two weeks. There was a gentleman I used to work with years and years ago that they had bets on the plant. They won't last two weeks. Wouldn't last three weeks. They was, they was a pool going around the plant. We was gathered there and one of the men said, yeah, some of us lost a lot of money on that, Dave. But we really seen that you're the real thing. Today, aren't you grateful for that deliverance? You, we, we can see here in verses 5, or verses, uh, verses, uh, verses 12, 11 and 12 again that he loosed him from his palsy. He was delivered from his sickness. He was able to walk. It says that immediately. Let's look at that verse again. And immediately he rose and took up his bed. He had no need for the bed. He didn't go up through the roof. He went out the door. He didn't have anybody carry him out. He went immediately. Went forth before them all and so much that they were all amazed. He probably said, I've never skipped before, but I can now. I've never jumped before, but I can now. I've never, I've never ran before, but I can now. I didn't know what it was like to be able to do things on your own. But praise the Lord, look at me now. A lost person didn't know how bad they were confined to their sin until Jesus loosed them and delivered them. We see here today that the open door was signified through faith in Jesus. The open door signified faith in Jesus. Think about that for a moment. How did we receive Jesus? We received Him by faith. We didn't know how it was going to turn out. We wasn't sure about it. But we had faith in Jesus that He was going to save us. It's the same way that this man that was, uh, that was sick of the, uh, the palsy was able to have an understanding. He had no idea what his friends were going to do or if he was even going to work. But he knew if anybody could change it, Jesus could. He saw their faith. In verses 5, And when Jesus saw their faith, He said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Jesus acted upon their faith. Church, today Jesus acts upon our faith. He acted upon our faith in Him that He was able to save us. Again, we didn't understand all of it, and sometimes if we just be honest with us, even the greatest of theologians still cannot understand the complexity of Jesus and who He is. But Jesus act upon their faith the same way that He can act upon yours tonight. If you don't know Jesus, you can if you don't know Jesus, He can save you. He can loose all the sin that has you bound down and give you joy and give you peace. Can you remember the day that Jesus saved you? Can you? Can you remember the day that you were set free from all your sins? The load that was taken off. Think about it for a minute. Think about where we were. And you say, well, preacher, I was saved at a young age. So was I. But it's just as much of a miracle to save a child. I said again, I'll say it again, as a, as a drunk. It's still a life-saving opportunity and a life-saving, life-saving change. Today, you can know Him. And know in Him in His fullness and His power if you just have faith in Him. Father, I love You today. I thank You for Your care and I thank You for Your protection. Lord, You know the, 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 the individuals that are here today. And as we talked about this morning, Lord, You are, you, you are, you, you are involved in individuals' lives. And Lord, I pray today, Lord, You continue being involved in these people's lives. Love on them and care for them. Convict and encourage, Lord, whatever it'll take. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. As we all stand, please.